Welcome back, everybody, to the Calavería Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things supernatural. I'm your host, Jose. And I'm your host, Samantha. And that is right, everybody. We are back from our pretty long hiatus. It's going to be five months. Right. You know, we're, we're, we're pushing it there. I mean, we had a lot of things planned for the end of last year, beginning of this year, but just, you know, how every, everybody's aware, right? Just life in general, there's the way that life works, things get in the way, you don't really have time to do things. And that's exactly what happened for us, right? We're both going to school, things happen, we don't have the same schedule. So all that stuff, just having to get through and just kind of see when it works best for both of us. It was it was a struggle, but, you know, we are back now, March, we have our episode and we hope to get back on track with these things. And we already had to have our next couple of episodes planned out. We have some things um, moving forward. So hopefully this will be probably the last time that this happens. And if this ever happens again in the future, you know, if anything, maybe just a month, right? Maybe a month without an episode. Because, yeah, this was a very long time, but I'm glad to be back. Samantha, what about you? I'm very glad to be back. And you know, even though we were on hiatus, I was happy to see people like so listening, more viewers coming, not viewers, sorry, more listeners coming in. And that was very, that was just good to know. Like people were so interested. We weren't going to just come back and people would be like, oh, who are you? Exactly. See, I, I was very scared about that. Right. And so like, although, you know, we're not breaking in like tons of listeners, like every single day, it's still nice to see that we're maintaining some sort of like listenership. Right. Um, people are still finding this like every every day, really. If it's one person, two people, you know, or however many, we still have people constantly listening to us, which is really nice, right? And our fans stuck through with this. Hopefully, when you see this on your feeds, you're like, oh, it's Calavaria. They're back. You know, that's that's really what we're hoping for. We're, you know, like, again, like I said, we're happy to see that we maintained our fans because I know a lot of times that's, that tends to happen. But I know you sort of tripped up and said viewers. That's actually one thing that I wanted to introduce. We're actually now on YouTube, not necessarily saying that we're going to be able to, you know, like one of those podcasts where you could watch us as a visual and just, you know, auditory, like if you want to just have it on the background. This is just going to be simply like the same way you would listen to us on Apple or Spotify or whatever you listen to the podcast on. It's the same thing, right? I know a lot of people like to just have something on in the background on TV or whatever, which you can now subscribe to us and listen to us on there. And it's the same as our podcast here, right? Just search up Calaveria. But I want to say we're probably the only people named Calaveria on YouTube. So it shouldn't be too hard to find us. But now that we sort of got all that out of the way, I just want to say, you know, happy holidays to everybody. I know this is very late. Very, very, very late. Three months late now. Happy holidays. Happy New Year to everybody. You know, happy, happy everything. Everything that we may have missed, you know, let's cover our bases there. But there's one thing I do want to talk about. You know, this is a new year, another year of the podcast. Um, you know, this is going to go be going on to our second year of the podcast. And I did want to talk about some sort of small little resolutions for the podcast, right? This last year, we saw some very big growth. I mean, we hit over like 100 followers on, you know, what both both podcasts, I want to say pr- primarily Apple, but you know, hopefully we see more growth there. We were featured on Apple podcast for Latino Heritage Month, that sorts of thing. So hopefully that can be another thing there. I mean, more people can find us. And it's just Getting more listeners, more uh, fans and stuff, right? That It's always nice to see. It helps us and it pushes us to want to create more. Either way, we're going to be here, whether it's, you know, one fan or the same fans that we have now. We're, we're going to continue doing this. I know we also want more fans simply because I know we've always been interested in having viewers submit or sorry, I keep saying viewers, but listeners submit stories. That's a big to us. That will be a big co- accomplishment. So I know that's one of my resolutions this year. Yeah, definitely. Like a a listener submitted stories episode, that would be amazing. You know, let's make that our primary goal for this year, right? As long as we have five stories, you know, whatever it is, we could really get into that and get some feedback. Maybe if you guys have anything else you want to suggest, as always, suggest it to us. Send it to us via email at calabriapod at gmail.com. Now, I think that's it for announcements. And without further ado, today's episode is on. Unexplained Phenomena. A quick trigger warning before we begin. We will be talking about topics that revolve around death, so please take care while listening. 
So have you ever heard of the phenomenon called the third man factor? I don't think so. So essentially what it is, is basically if a person is facing a life-threatening event alone or say in like a small group of people, they are usually accompanied by an unseen or unexplainable being that helps them through this event. They help with comfort, actually like physically helping them and or just in general, just emotional support. I'm sure you probably have heard of the stories or maybe you've heard of a story where someone had survived a car crash and when the EMTs come or whoever comes to help them, first thing they tell the people are like, oh, thank the person who who was waiting with me or thank the thank the man, thank the woman who was helping me, who helped me get out of the car. And the people that are there are just like, there's no one here. It's just you. Like, what are you talking about? No one was here to help you. I don't know if you heard of a story similar to that. Yeah, I'm definitely getting sort of like, you know, to me, the first thing that I sort of think of is like a guardian angel type situation. Exactly. Typically with this phenomenon, people believe it has religious ties. They think it's a guardian angel. They think maybe it's a relative that's helping you. Maybe it's just anything supernatural, really. But obviously with skeptics, some people think there has to be like a science-based reason, right? There's actually a theory created by an author, John Geiger, who wrote the book, The Third Man Factor, Surviving the Impossible. He believes it's a natural phenomenon that happens, similar to how our brain gives us adrenaline rushes during those life-threatening moments. So like if you've heard like people who've been shot before and they're like in the heat of the moment, and they don't feel that pain and they don't realize they're shot until like the very end. He's essentially saying it's just as natural as that. After doing all my research and finding like a bunch of different stories about this phenomenon occurring, I don't know if I entirely believe that though. I could definitely see that happening for like someone in a car crash, someone in a fire, someone just trying to survive like a really brutal incident happening and their body is just in shock. I actually want to discuss the earliest recording of the third man factor. It's actually based off of the Ernest Shackleton's Arctic expedition, way back in 1916. During the expedition, the team's boat had gotten stuck in the ice, so they were forced to make it through the Arctic via foot until they reached the base they were headed towards. During this 36-hour journey, Shackleton documented that although there were just three of them out there, it actually felt as if there were four. Reading into the story about the Arctic expedition and how it was just three of them and how they were together for 36 hours, but for most of those hours, Shackleton fully like knew there was just three of them there, but he felt deep in his soul like there was a fourth person there helping them get through this journey. Because of that, I don't really know if I believe that third man factor is similar to adrenaline because typically when you think of light threatening situations, they don't occur for a very, very long time, like a 36-hour journey. At some point, I'm sure that effect would have worn off or something. Right, it seems like most likely it's something immediate. But for almost a day and a half, they were supposedly hallucinating another person, but they never said like they saw them. They just felt the presence of another person. They didn't interact with them or anything like that, but they just felt as if someone was there with them. I do think like I get I see what you're getting at there like it definitely seems like something that's I guess sort of related to the the theory itself but in a sense like unrelated because of the fact that like they're not necessarily saying that they're seeing somebody else but more that they're feeling somebody else like a presence which that definitely seems like an like something very supernatural or otherworldly which it may be because of the prolonged you know, exposure to whatever it was, right? Whatever the situation was, maybe they were hallucinating. Maybe it was something that was there. I don't know what happened in this situation, but maybe something could have been there just to sort of like give them hope or to watch over them. Exactly. To me, I would have understood if they hallucinated someone was there. Like, you know, they're going through mountains, they're going over glaciers and they're just seeing pure white. I know when people, I know in psychology, people say, if you're just in a white room or if you're just staring at something that's purely white, you do start having like visual hallucinations, but they weren't having those. 
They just felt someone's presence. Yeah, it's sort of that kind of like, I guess the thing that I sort of related it to would be like, you wake, you know, as a kid, right? Or even now, I mean, you wake up in the middle of the night, obviously, you know, dark room or whatever, and you kind of feel like, oh God, it feels like there's something there. Or like, if you get sleep paralysis, you feel like there is something there. There's a presence in my room. I think that's something that most people probably experience just in general too. I mean, like, even if, you know, it's an actual person, you can kind of feel that somebody's there. It's actually because of this Arctic expedition that this phenomenon got its name, the third man factor. The story actually inspired the famous poet T.S. Eliot to essentially write a poem about this phenomenon. It was called The Wasteland, and I'll read it for you guys here. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? I know when I first read this poem, I was kind of just like, I kind of got chills a little bit because I was just like, that's kind of, it kind of seems spooky almost, where you look, you feel as if there is someone else there, but then you look over, you count, there's only two of you guys there. It definitely seems like you can interpret it like in many different ways, like if you want to kind of make it in the sense where like, there is something scary about it like oh gosh you're seeing like a spirit or in the case of like where people have just been exposed to some like sort of like situation like maybe getting you know like okay in this case they were stranded on like a mountain or whatever right or being lost at sea or something like you begin to start seeing things and you're like well who is this and so it kind of does play with your mind a bit kind of like make you wonder well what exactly is going on exactly I think T.S. Eliot puts kind of the phenomenon perfectly in words when, in the line, I do not know whether a man or a woman. It's just like that brief description. In all the stories I've read, no one ever gives an amazing description of the person who helped them. They were just saying, it was a man, no, it was a woman. Actually, I don't know who helped me. They're confused and they want to thank them, but they don't know who helped them. I think that's, that is very telling, I mean... I personally, I've heard a couple of these stories. I'm not very familiar with that. I know you are, obviously, since you did the research for for your topic today. But I think that is a very good point to point out. Like, that's that uh, poem, right? That line really does point out that fact. I mean, it also just relates to, like, what we've, we've talked about before, where you see sort of, like, shadow entities or just figures, you know, in the corner of your eye or whatever. You can't really say that's a man or a woman or, you know, whatever the case may be. It's just that it's a thing there's someone there or something there we can't really put a name on it or really tell you exactly what it is but we know we saw something on that end i actually have an article talking about a story where a 16 year old girl had experienced a pretty bad car crash and she's actually actively looking for the man that she believes helped her her family calls it her guardian angel and they don't have any description at all she just recognizes that it was a man A family in Concord is searching for a man being called a guardian angel after he helped a teen girl after a car crash. The crash happened on 185 North near Exit 58 in Concord on August 16, 2019. A 16-year-old driver was hit, her car rocking over, then sitting exposed to oncoming traffic. Just afterward, that girl says a stranger came to her to protect her, but then disappeared. That driver is 16-year-old Athena Martini. She made it out of the hospital with some bumps and bruises, but now she's on a search for the man she's calling her guardian angel. He put his life in danger and for a complete stranger, said Daniela Martini, Athena's mother. Daniela Martini said when her phone rang earlier this month, it was her daughter, Athena, in a panic. I just remember being on my side, but before that, going into the divider, said Athena. The 16-year-old was driving down 85 when someone hit her and her car spun out. She was scared she would be hit again by passing traffic. Then she heard a voice. I remember freaking out, not sure what to do. And he just came and said, I watched this happen. It's going to be okay. This man who stopped, he was, he was an angel, said Danielle. Athena couldn't see out of her car through the deployed airbag. He said, I'll stand in front of your car so you are okay and no one can hit you. 
He would be there to protect her, and as long as he was there, no one would hit her again, because she was terrified someone would hit her again, said Danielle. Very brave, because he didn't even know me, said Athena. Athena says that the man stayed out on the 85 with her, risking his life until first responders arrived, then disappeared. I didn't expect anyone to stop and make sure everything was okay and be that nice, said Athena. Now she just wants to find this man. He's changed her life. Right away, she said, Mom, in an instant I could be gone, said Danielle. I just want to hug him because he was truly put in the right place at the right time. That was a news article titled Teen Driver Searching for Mysterious Garden Angel Who Helped Her After Accident on 185 Near Concord by WTV3. The majority of the times that I, at least, that I can remember where I've heard stories of somebody being saved by like a guardian angel, it's sort of something very similar to this where they kind of have that moment of peace. I think specifically like when he tells her, right, like everything's going to be okay. I'm going to be here with you there's always some sort of moment like that where like amongst all the chaos there's that kind of like they're there to like bring it down and like give that individual that sense of peace in a moment of otherwise chaos so um i think mean, just especially with the whole idea of like okay now she's trying to look for him and he's not there when i feel like in a moment like that time seems to like slow down you know like i've been in a couple of incidents before and i could tell you like time does seem to slow down like you vividly remember every little detail leading up to your accident or whatever the case may be so i don't doubt that if she says that she saw somebody somebody spoke to her i think that's probably more credible because it's one thing to just kind of be like oh i saw somebody but this person spoke to her i feel like that is more credible than just kind of like i saw this person there so i'm leaning more towards she definitely did see somebody somebody did help her whether this is a guardian angel or whatever, I have no idea, but this is definitely more in line with the stories that I've heard in the past. Same. When I found this when I found this article, it, it was kind of just like that classic tale of someone helping someone in a car crash and the person like Athena was searching for the person who helped them, but everyone was just like, no one was there. Like, no one else saw that man. No one was able to help her find him for her. And it's just... To me, it's just the classic third man factor story that I've always heard of. Yeah. And I would say, like, I don't know if I would necessarily associate it with, like, that, you know, third man factor theory where, like, it's just something because of the uh, because of the incident she was in. She just conjured up some person. I feel like this is something very different. You know, I think maybe like if in a different situation, I know you mentioned something like somebody getting shot or whatever, maybe like that. But when something as instantaneous as a car crash and. You know, from my from like the looks of it, like she was lucky to be alive after all this, right? Or lucky to kind of like be unscathed. This is like immediate, right? Like you would feel the effects of that car crash immediately. So for that to sort of like sort of like happen right away, I think that's very different. So it kind of seems like, at least in my eyes, like very hard to just conjure somebody up in that very instant for that very moment. You know, adrenaline just hits you that hard, like that fast. I don't I don't really know if I would associate it with that theory. I have a bunch of other stories that they're definitely related, I want to say, like to this fa- to the third man factor. And they also kind of just go against like the scientific theory that a lot of people have, where it's just a phenomenon that naturally happens in our brains when we're in life threatening situations. My next few stories actually come from a Reddit where people tell their stories about the third man syndrome after learning about it from someone's post. On New Year's Eve 2003, I was on a ski trip in Chamonix, France. I was 23 and not much of a skier. I had skied only a handful of times in my life. I never acquired any skills on the slopes. I could manage down skis runs as long as I had a friend to follow. I was clumsy, but could hyper-focus on the other skis and mimic their motions. I was completely lost on my own. I had managed to trail my friends all day never taking in the many pathways down the infamous Alps. I had no map, no sense of direction as to where I was. Towards the end of the day, around 3.30 p.m., my friends and I were at the top of one of the many steeps when I accidentally got separated from them. Confident that they would return for me, I stayed in an open area where they could easily see my yellow jacket. 
As I stayed in place, bracing the freezing temperature and waiting for my friends, heavy fog rolled in. Fewer and fewer people came down the slopes, until there were none. I heard the faint sounds of the snowmobiles drive down the mountain. The last of the ski lift staff were leaving for the day. It was at that moment I knew I was alone on the mountain. Panic set in. I couldn't move my legs. My body had completely stiffened. I could feel the hair that framed my face ice over. Confronted by the reality that I could freeze to death and with my chin trembling, I started to speak out to my grandparents as I awaited my fate. I must have stood there frozen in place for almost an hour. Paralyzed with fear and watching the last of the muted daylight disappear, I heard the sound of someone whimsically whistling in the distance above me. The melody quickly grew louder and out of nowhere appeared a young man. He was casually skiing down the mountain with his hands clasped behind his back with no poles. He was much taller than me, maybe even shorter, at 5'3". He wore a white t-shirt with the sleeves rolled up like he was in the movie Grease, black cargo pants, and a black fisherman's cap. His black curly hair framed his round, shaven face. Upon seeing him, I scream, Bonjour! Bonjour! He stops right in front of me. He stood there, looking slightly confused by my presence. After a few quiet moments of us staring at each other, he motions for me to follow him. My body was in shock and shaking. I couldn't remember how to walk, so I thrust my body forward, tripping over my skis and praying that I don't break my legs. Each time I fell, he stood patiently waiting for me to get up. After finally gaining my balance, I was able to focus on his skis and go down the mountain. I can't recall how long I followed him for, but I know we had to go down a combination of slopes and trails. I remember how quiet it was, and of course, his skis. They were all I could concentrate on. I knew if I made one false move, then I could potentially ski off a ledge. Out of nowhere, we came upon a couple standing on the trail. My angel guide stopped in front of them and mentioned for me to follow the pair before he disappeared into the fog. The couple looked at me confused as if I had appeared out of nowhere. The next thing I knew, they're guiding me the rest of the way down the mountain. Whoever my angel guide was that day, his image and his whistling are entrenched in my memory, and I am alive because of him. I'm not sure if this is the same thing or something completely different, but 11-year-old me was walking home from school one day and was attacked by a pretty massive dog. I was wearing a jersey and luckily after initially knocking me down, his teeth got tangled in my jersey on my shoulder. I knew in a matter of seconds he was going to rip free and kill me. Like, I knew that. Weirdly accepted it kind of thing. Then out of nowhere, this man is just there, picks the dog up off me, and fucking launches him. He stands me up, mumbled something about, it's okay, or something. I never really understood exactly what he said. Then just gets in this truck that was 100% was right next to me on the road, but never saw slash heard it. And this all happened within literal seconds, and just drives away. Again, very small town, everyone knows everyone, and what they drive, even in surrounding small towns. No one knew this guy, and I never saw him or the truck again. What I remember most is when he picked the dog up. His silhouette was completely shadowed, but the sun wasn't shining. A friend and I were walking home from the clubs in Florence, Italy. We walked past an American girl walking the opposite way, her GPS blurring where to go. She seemed drunk. We walked past her, paused, then turned around to look at her again. We turned around and there was an American man looking very fresh and clean for 4 a.m. He said, Is that your friend over there? We said, No. He asked, Should you go be her friend? We went to walk her home and wait at her door for her friends to buzz her up. Right next to her apartment door was a man hiding behind a parked car, exposed, jacking off the entire time we stood there. My friend and I held hands and booked it all the way home after the girl got inside safely. When we got home, we began discussing what had happened. I said, what about the beautiful blonde man who told us to help her? He was wearing the exact same outfit my dad used to wear on Sundays. She was like, blonde? No, he was Latino like me and was dressed like my dad. It's still the weirdest thing that ever happened to me. 
So let's talk about that last one first. That one, I've never heard of anything like that happening before. So clearly this is, you know, somebody that was there meant, you know, like to, to help protect that woman, right? In a sense, kind of like worked as like a middleman to like, hey, go help her. And they did so. But the fact that they seen like a completely different person that resembled like their father that's that's like very like i don't know i've never heard of anything like that before that immediately put me on edge like wait what that's the part where i was just like i have to read this story for the podcast i was like it's very similar to like guardian angels you know like that man was definitely looking out for that drunk girl and he appeared to these other two girls i'm assuming and it was just like hey go help her out she's in trouble he knew that he couldn't help her directly so he was trying to like hint towards them I, yeah, I guess you could say that like he appeared to them in a in a state that like they knew that they could trust, right? So like their father, like somebody like okay, like yeah, I'm gonna trust my dad. You know, it's my dad, and they resembled it. So maybe that's why it sort of presented themselves that way. That's what I was thinking, and it's just that story. Honestly, just was crazy to me when I read it. The other story I also want to talk about is is the one where the person got lost while they were skiing. I found it interesting how they basically just stood there the whole entire time first of all that to me that's crazy like i honestly props to them for just being like my friends will find me but their friends did not find them (laughs) instead they found like someone who looked like a greaser they said you know and to me i thought that was a very interesting description as well it's just something about how his sleeves were rolled up like first of all this dude is in the snow and he has his sleeves rolled up and he has no ski poles nothing like that He's just whistling along, you know, just reading that story. It just sounded like that's an entity, like that's a divine being or something just casually. Right, just like somebody just spawned in the snow with non-snow like gear, clothing or whatever. Like there's there's definitely something up with there. Yeah, and then that other story where the the person kind of like, you know, whoever the, the you know, I, I'm just going to refer to like all of these sort of as like guardian angels i think that's probably the way that most people will recognize them but i think that very that goes back to like what i was talking about earlier where most people don't know what they are they can't really say like this is exactly how they look or it was a man or a woman where it was literally a shadow although there was like no sun out like the sun there's nothing there to actually cast a shadow but there it was all these stories in general show like different aspects of this phenomenon of guardian angels third man factor whatever you want to call it you know it all shows very interesting aspects and it just shows how unique these experiences are not one is alike not one is there's no set like okay this has to happen this has to happen like no it's just someone coming to help them in their time of need these stories were told from users Negotiation Exotic 730, probably Tom Hanks, and Worried Pie 7025. This whole idea of like guardian angels and all that stuff, I feel like this is something that like most people, I mean, have probably heard about. I mean, I wouldn't say most people have experienced this, but I could imagine that if you do experience something like this, like you're definitely thinking that this is you're not you know thinking like oh my god i I made that up i hallucinated that you're definitely thinking like this was somebody that was there that was meant to protect me or there for whatever reason there to help me out in my time of need so i'm really glad that you chose this this is something that i wouldn't have thought of to talk about on the podcast but i think it's something that kind of intersects with all different forms of life that most people can probably relate to in some sort of way so with that let's go ahead and move on to my topic for today. So I chose to talk about something that personally I've experienced before. There may be some of you out there that are listening to this that may have heard of some stuff like this or even experienced this or know somebody who experienced these sort of things. And what I'm talking about is very strange dreams. So for example, I have a couple stories that talk about people who sort of like have dreams about things that will happen in the future, uh, dreaming about sort of like Uh, deaths of like loved ones or just individuals like that or just having individuals come visit them after their death in their dreams and sort of like just giving them a message so these sort of dreams I would say feel very real 
And I think that's probably what we can categorize these as like, you know, future telling dreams or, you know, premonition dreams. But all of these do have that factor where the people kind of wake up and are like, what just happened? You know, like, was that real? And I could, like I said, I've had that experience before. Granted, my dreams aren't to this extent. They are more of like, I just kind of have like, a dream about a normal day and I wake up thinking that I actually lived that day until I realize that oh wait no it's actually Saturday and you know my dream was like Monday so that's kind of like how I bring uh, come back to reality but as you'll hear from some of these stories that distinction isn't probably as evident right away or this would be like a major deja vu moment so with that being said let's get into the stories My best friend and I would talk about crazy dreams we had. Never thought much of it until he told me about one where he got hit by a car and died. We were about 15 to 16 when he told me about the dream. We were into conspiracies, stuff like aliens, paranormal, lucid dreaming, so we talk about stuff like that a lot. My friend died right before he would have turned 20. He said he was riding a skateboard wearing all black when the car hit him and he could see everyone at his funeral. He even said his crush was there at his funeral and laughed about it. He just kept going on about how it was so real and it really shook me up until eventually I forgot about it. Then a few years later, after I'd long forgot about the dream he told me about, it happened for real. His crush was at the funeral. He did get hit by a car and die. He was wearing all black like in the dream. And he was riding my skateboard. It was all true. I still don't know what to make of it all. Every single detail I remember from his dream came true. I'm sure there's parts of it he told me that I don't remember. I felt crazy. I didn't tell anyone about it. I just don't know why or how he saw it happen in his dream and think what if he never told me about it. It just left me with so many questions. But I guess now I have proof at least that our souls go on after we die. I just wish I knew why he experienced that dream and told me about it. Like there had to be some kind of reason. I just think about how I wouldn't have believed this story if I hadn't experienced it myself. Has anyone ever experienced anything similar? One comment responding to this post read this. My mom used to always tell me about a dream she would have recurring for years when I was riding my bike at around 16 years old. I got shot and killed. She said I was in a neighborhood where there was a ton of trees around. Years later, I turned 16. She would still have the dream from time to time and tell me about it every time she would. I found myself in that exact situation. I was 16, riding my bike, and a speeding car almost hit my friend. He exclaimed, Oh, fuck! And the vehicle stopped. And a man with a gun stepped out of the car. My friend and I proceeded to ride down a street that had a large amount of trees. The vehicle was thrown into reverse and blocked the intersection of the road we were on that would lead back to home and to safety. I then made the idiotic decision to tell my friend to keep his mouth shut and stay where he was. I then walked over to the vehicle. One window rolled down, the passenger side window. There's someone in the passenger seat with what is clearly a handgun. The seat was leaned all the way back and it was so dark I could not see the person's face. The driver was looking at me and I asked him what the problem was in a respectful manner as to not get shot right there and then. He asked why we were running our mouths. I then explained to him that we were not saying anything to them. I told him that he had almost hit my friend with his car and that my friend said, oh fuck. He told me that I was lucky he didn't shoot us when he got out of the car and told me that my friend needed to be more careful. We went home and I told my mom that her dream almost came true. She hasn't had the dream since. I'm 22 now. Had I not chosen my words wisely that day and taken the time to speak, I fear my mother would have related to your story to a T. I think that's pretty crazy how the mom just kept having that same exact dream over and over. I think her even telling her son that dream over and over is kind of just her warning him if that ever happens, like, be careful. And each time, I'm pretty sure each time she told him, like, she remembered more and more details. And so I guess in the moment he was able to be like, okay, what should I do? (laughs) And just be prepared for that, you know? I thought that was really crazy. Like the first one, you know, it was kind of like somebody who kind of saw their own demise in a way, you know, rest in peace to that individual's friends. But this other one is very different because it's like a spin on that same sort of situation where it's 
a loved one dreaming about another person. I feel like that's more common probably with among these stories because people sent, tend to like dream about loved ones right before they pass or you know they come to them before like in the middle of the night and just kind of like it's okay and then the next morning they find out that that individual passed right before they uh, seen them right or later that night when they would have been dreaming about them and that leads me to my next story so as the title says I met my child a decade before he was born when I was 16 to 17 I was feeling deeply suicidal I wanted to die and be put out of my misery It was a very dark time for me, and I was close to going through with it. One night, I had a very clear dream. I could see a man in his 20s with dirty blonde hair staring at me from a bench. He said loudly, Mom, you have to get yourself together because I'm coming home soon. It's odd because I have dark brown hair, and he didn't look like how I imagined my son would look. I woke up, and this dream startled me. It felt so real, crystal clear. I can still see him and hear him now. A year after that dream, I met his dad, who also had dark brown hair. It was an abusive relationship for years, and I always wanted to leave, but something always happened that made me stay. Fast forward eight years, and I became pregnant. I instantly knew it was a boy. He was born, and he'll be two this year. His hair is dirty blonde, and I just know that he is the same person as the man in my dream. He looks just like the toddler version of him. Has anyone else had an experience similar to this? I feel bothered by it on a weekly basis. It feels like I met my now ex just so that he would be born. I can't help but ask why. Why did he choose me? Why choose a horrible dad? It would be amazing to hear similar experiences just so that I know I'm not out of my mind. So this story, I thought it was very weird because it's like a whole different take on... This situation, I feel like when you hear of people sort of dreaming about something that happens in the future, it's something that may happen in like the near future, as opposed to like eight, ten years later, and then kind of being like, that's why I dreamed, or that's what I dreamed about. Yeah, kind of like they just recall that dream, like kind of like how your first story, where the guy had forgotten about his friend's dream and the conversations they had about it. And it's almost as if they get major deja vu not even deja vu it's just kind of just like they remember it they remember vividly just seeing everything and knowing about this future event that was going to happen this whole idea of stuff like that like it, it really makes me think that there are people out there who can sort of predict things like probably unbeknownst to them like in this case it's not like they had a history of stuff like this happening but i actually do have some sort of like small little anecdote from actually uh, my girlfriend's sister, which, you know, for those of you that know her, her name's Lolly. So her sister goes on to say, I asked, you know, I sort of asked them, like, have you experienced anything, you know, as any strange dreams or something may have happened? You know, you dream about something and then it happens later on in the future or just something that you felt was so vivid and real, like you just couldn't distinguish it from reality. Well, she went on to say that she does remember something that she would dream about constantly. So she said she would always get like these sort of like dreams or signs in her every day to day life about like a car accident, right? Um, She even had a dream that like she got something in the mail about like getting life insurance for like car accidents. And even throughout her days, like shortly like following this, all this like different stuff, she would see like car accidents. And she would always like come across them like every single day for a while after like all these different signs were coming at uh, coming towards her. So it was kind of like for whatever reason this was a sign to her. Although she didn't experience it herself, these were things that like just occurred every single day. You know, the days leading up to this, just during this time, which I find that very weird and you know oddly specific. Like, what was it with car accidents in general that she you know for some reason like something was trying to warn her about it. She even told me about a time where she ended up getting surgery in seventh grade and she already knew it was going to happen. Like she knew this was going to happen before she even experienced any sort of pain or anything before they even knew that she was going to need surgery in the first place. And just from assumption, I would assume this is something that she like sort of dreamed about. Just speaking with her in the past, like she's always kind of had like a knack for these sort of things, specifically when it comes to sort of like predicting like pregnancies within their family 
she kind of has this uh, streak where like if she dreams that somebody's pregnant, they actually do end up coming out like the, they're pregnant within that, you know, the time leading up to that, right? Like a month or so in advance. Like it is very strange. And like I mentioned, she's like sort of like accurately predicted this thus far. There hasn't been a moment where she's like streamed of somebody like being pregnant or something like that. And it hasn't happened. So I definitely feel like there are people for whatever reason, they sort of get these signs about things happening in day to day life. No, definitely. I know my best friend, Anna, she is definitely one of those people. Similar to how, like, Lolly's sister is able to predict, like, when someone in her family is going to be pregnant because based off her dreams. I know she, whenever she has a dream that she herself is pregnant, like, in her dream, she's pregnant. Someone in her family or someone close to her is pregnant, like, immediately after, like, the day after, or two days after, she learns, okay, they're pregnant. And she's like, that's why I had that dream. I know she told me before that she used to have dreams back like when she was in preschool, basically of big events that would happen. Like, say she had to do a recital and stuff like that. She would dream about it and she would dream of very specific moments. Like, I can't remember if she had said a girl was going to pee her pants or something like that. Or like this girl had done something to her and made it seem like she was going to pee her pants or something. And the very next day, that same exact thing happened. The recital is happening. The girl pees her pants. The teacher, whatever, like every little minute detail that she could remember happens. Right. Like these seems like very like severe cases of deja vu. Like how do you explain this? You know, you're literally, I mean, in a sense, you live this right in your dream and then you're actually seeing it in reality. Like and, you know, if I were to experience anything like this, I definitely think I was a psychic or like something like that. Right. You know, I feel like I ha- I'd i hold some sort of power that I would think I have my third eye open. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like this would be something where like, damn, like, OK. But at the same time, like there's just something about it that's kind of like eerie, you know, like it's kind of scary to think like, OK, I can tell the future, you know, to in this case, you know, like sort of like a minor extent, like how far does this sort of power extend? You know, what could I see in the future or like how is this even possible? Could you change the future like in your second story where the mother kept telling her son about that dream she had and essentially she changed it by doing so? Right. In some in some sense, like it sort of seems like she did because it seems like maybe subconsciously the son or the storyteller in that story was aware of what was happening and was like, okay, maybe, you know, with the word choice and the way he kind of just approached it and just kind of like de-escalated it subconsciously he saved himself with that being said though i do have some more and it only seems to get weirder my fiance had a dream last night i believe it was astral projection for context i used to live in a house with what i believe was either an extremely evil spirit or even a demon my parents moved me into the house when i was four my brother was one when you walked into the house there was two big rooms, to your right and left, that were open. When you walked past, you'd be in our giant living room. Then to the left was the entrance to the hallway. Immediately to the right was my room. A little to the left was the bathroom. And at the end was my brother's room. Immediately after moving in, I had nightmares of things coming in through my window and killing me. Seventeen years later, I still remember those dreams very vividly. My brother did not last long being in that room at the end of the hall. He was horrified of it, never got good sleep, ended up moving his bed into my parents' room, and his bedroom was left to be for our toys, and later, storage. As years went by, I had more and more nightmares. When I got to middle school, I'd wake up with deep scratches in my arms and to a shadow man standing at the foot of my bed, threatening me my life. He never spoke, but I understood what he was saying. Even my friends I had over as I grew up felt the evil, and it got stronger every year. Soon, it made its way to the bathroom, where no one was brave enough to even look in the mirror in fear of seeing something they didn't want to. As you walked down the hallway, you felt the heaviness of it. As you approached the doorframe of that room, it became stronger. When you actually entered, all of your fight-or-flight instincts would kick in. You'd feel the pure evil presence that felt like a threat to your life. As a child, I would curse out my parents, cut myself, have panic attacks, 
At one point, I threw a table at my father, and I do not remember any bit of it. I only know because of my parents. It was regular for us to need someone at the door to keep an eye on us to simply get a toy or Christmas decorations that were kept there as storage. Now to my fiancé's dream. First, he has never seen this house, as I moved out at 17 and made him at 18. This dream, he woke up multiple times and was still in his dream. First, he described being shown a hallway, almost like a camera in a movie, and at the end, he entered the room. He saw me as a little girl in a blue nightgown, which he had never seen, but he was able to describe it perfectly, even my Shirley Temple brown curls, which never grew back after being five years old. I was screaming at the top of my lungs to the corner of the room, and he said it seemed out of anger and fear. I just kept screaming. Then he was teleported to a room that looked like the bedroom. He described it as looking like a playroom, but with the table in the center that he was strapped to. The thing, evil spirit, demon, whatever, came in. Without speaking, communicated that he was going to torture him and me next. My fiancé looked at it in the face and stared him down. Its facial features were blurred. This pissed the spirit off and it left. My fiancé had to conjure up a Bible, which allowed him to escape. Once he did, he woke up next to me, in his dream again, voices in his head telling him that it was coming for me next. He grabbed my hand as hard as he could and protected me, but it got him again. It appeared again and told my fiancé that it was pissed that it couldn't get to me, again staring him down, asserting dominance. A door opened that led to a backyard, also described perfectly at this house, that again, my fiancé has never seen. He described a tree with a sticky note that said, Pluribus Septum, in Latin. Yes, he was able to read this in his dream, which scientifically or psychologically is not supposed to happen. He woke up again. This time, he was in the center of the living room. He continued to pinch himself, hit himself, smack himself, until finally, he woke up in real life, with the gas so loud, it woke me up. It was 6.30 a.m., and he told me about the dream. After research, Pluribus septum are real Latin words. No, he does not know Latin, but these words were tattooed in his head after waking up. It means something along the lines of multiple pathways or multiple walls. I'm convinced that it's still attached to me. It knows where I am. It knew when I moved three states away as it visited me in my own dream, and I was back in that house having to escape its grasp. I could read, write, and feel my own punches on myself physically in my dream after escaping from him again. He has retaliated multiple times, possessing me before officially moving a town away to almost hurt my parents, visiting me in my dreams in the new house, visiting in my dream in my first apartment with my now fiancé, and once again visiting in our second apartment, 1,000 miles away. He is angry. I'm no longer close enough for him to physically hurt me. I think a part of him is still with me, and I'm furiously angry he has now gone after my partner. I hate him. He ruined my childhood. He's given me trauma. I can never vent to a therapist about. This post is actually helping, so thank you for reading. And I do just want to end off by saying that this story does have a couple edits to it that I will not be talking about on this. If you are interested in hearing this, uh, be sure to stick around to the end when I do mention the um, individual and the name of their post. But for reasons that will be evident if you do check it out, I will not be reading that on here. But Samantha, what do you think about this? Like, this is something that definitely has like its own sort of paranormal side to it. But the fact that this sort of like creeps into a dream, like, what are your thoughts? To me, it shows that dreams are are not just something our brains create just for fun, you know, because I feel like anyone who's dreaming this stuff isn't doing it on purpose or anything like that. Dreams definitely have a real world tide and just in general like a tie to different universes or different realms like wherever this demon creature being is coming from to haunt this person attack this person they're coming to them in their dreams so i mean like she says she doesn't really know what to call this this entity right she calls it a demon or an evil spirit and i mean 
I don't doubt that it is something malevolent because it seems like it has been messing with her and torturing her for pretty much her entire life. So I don't think we'd be remiss to call it some sort of like evil spirit there. But I think the fact that it's like sort of transcending this physical realm that we're in into like a dream state and not even just, you know, her dream state, it's her loved one's dream state, like her partner, her, her fiance, right? Like, I think that just says so much about what this thing is and like what it's willing to do to sort of like get to her. Like, I have never heard of anything like this before. Like, I feel like this is something that you kind of see like in the movies. Like, this immediately reminded me of like Insidious or something like that. Like, this is very, very scary. I definitely don't want to ever experience anything remotely close to this. Same here. Let us know what you guys think. This, like I said, definitely is something that I've never really heard about. Um, I'd be very, you know, interested to hear if anybody else has heard of anything remotely close to this happening before, either to themselves or a loved one. So let us know. Okay, I had this dream a few years ago, but to this day, I still think about it often. And I don't know, it's just burned into my memory. So it starts like this. I'm in a very green, rainy forest. My face is wet. It's cold. I have on a green jacket, cargo-looking pants, and boots. I'm running, and it feels like running for my life. I can tell that I'm scared because I'm breathing hard. My heart is pounding, and it's like I also know that I have nobody, and it's just me. But I keep running, and eventually I see tents scattered everywhere in this forest. And there's people in them and around them, but I can't see their faces. I spot an empty tent, and I quickly run into it and hide, but I don't know what I'm hiding from exactly. I didn't get a chance to zip it up all the way, and for a moment, I'm catching my breath. Then all of a sudden, I hear panic. People are running past the tents, screaming, so I quickly get the hell out of my tent and keep running in the same direction I was before, and keep running until I hit a fence, and on the other side of this fence is a military base. I don't know how I know that in the dream, but I just do. I'm hanging onto it out of exhaustion, and for a split second, I feel relief, till I see it's destroyed and it's on fire. Fire is everywhere, and I look up and see the sign, and it says in big white letters, Auckland Air Force Base. Then, I abruptly wake up. I have never heard of a place called Auckland in my life. Never knew it existed, never heard of it. Nothing. So I think about this weird vivid dream for a couple of days, till I look up the words. And sure enough, this place called Auckland, New Zealand actually exists, and there's a Royal New Zealand Air Force Base located near a harbor in Auckland. I just don't understand how I can have this dream about a place I've never been to, let alone a new existed at all. I don't know where I was supposed this, whether it's even paranormal or I'm just crazy, but to this day, the word Auckland will pop up here and there, whether it's the newspaper, TV, Facebook, or whatever. It's just strange to me, and I want to know what others think of this. So, immediately, Samantha, what are you thinking? I honestly, to me, it's making me wonder, like, do they have maybe some future business in Auckland or whatever it's called? Like, I've never heard of that place. Like, obviously, there's some strong ties to them. Maybe it's like, something that they just always they just need to end up going you know and there they'll find i don't even know something important in their life i i wonder the same thing right like i wasn't able i mean they didn't mention in the story i was looking through the comments i I couldn't find it myself but i wonder if they're even from new zealand like they said they don't they never even knew this place existed which i mean granted you can tell me some random city in the u.s i mean i wouldn't know it You know, like the U.S. is so big, which I don't really know much about New Zealand, but I I could imagine the same could be the case. So I think it's even stranger if this person isn't even from the same country, you know, but I'm on that same boat as you, you know, like there has to be something I feel that's like sort of like connected to him. I don't know if this exact situation may be something they're going to be into. I mean, let's hope not. But there is definitely something that I think maybe later on in their future, they're connected to it. Or if not, maybe somebody in their past, right, like an ancestor or somebody. That's what I was thinking. Like, you know what? Maybe it's like a past life, an ancestor. You know how some people, or not some people, I should say like, there's those stories out there where children are able to recall their past lives. 
maybe this is kind of just their past lives just being like this is where we're from <laughs> i don't know right maybe yeah somebody did mention in the comments like they you know put like reincarnation question mark and I, th- I guess that's something like you're getting to where it could be something like that i i think it is very strange though to kind of like have something in your dream and like i don't know if this is true at all i could be just making this up entirely but similarly to the past story i just talked about right where like they vividly remember the like what was on the note right which i feel like i have heard of something like that before where like time and like words and those sorts of things like you know it's like a jumbled mess it's like if you've ever entered anything into like ai ai can't really like write out words like it's gonna be jumbled and you know misspelled and that sorts of thing which if you look away it's gonna be different when you look back exactly so i feel like for that to be so vivid and just ingrained it's it's something like it has to be for a reason and then the whole idea of them just like consistently seeing this in tv news facebook like that's weird i think that really goes back to it if they're not from new zealand at all like that is very weird to just get stuff you know specifically about auckland i really enjoy talking about these stories and i hope you guys enjoyed listening to them you heard my best friend dreamed about his actual death by the user johnny b 1917 a comment on that post by user OK Photojournalist 405 I met my son 10 years before he was born in a dream by user Rain the Llama. My fiance had a dream of a demon I used to live with by user I love cookie 5432. And finally, I had this strange vivid dream about a place I didn't know existed by user nowhere with two E's. Again, I hope you guys all enjoyed what I would call this first installment of Unexplained Phenomena. Lord knows there's many different things we could talk about, so we'll be sure to cover those in the future. But Samantha, do you have a TikTok for us today? I do, and this one's kind of crazy. And when you watch it, you're going to be creeped out, honestly, towards the end. The beginning, it's a little slow. You know, there's a lot of buildup. So essentially what happens in this video is... There's this man and like this girl in the tree and like they're kind of just crawling around at in the dark and their friends are recording them. They're speaking Spanish. They're having banter or whatever. But then as the two start to go down the tree and just get back onto the ground, the person recording the video starts zooming in on the man's face and his face almost looks unhuman. He has this, I want to say almost like evil gremlin like a monstery face i don't know how else to describe it and you get you guys just have to see it honestly and all his friends in the video just start screaming that's not him that's not him they're saying his name they're like that's not him like who is that like what the hell is happening i gotta say i was not prepared for this tiktok (laughs) samantha kind of like surprised me with this you know sometimes we do we kind of like prep ourselves with this but this definitely scared me you know we're recording this episode right now it's three o'clock in the morning so of course you know this has to be the time where where i see this for the first time it is very scary it is it definitely seems like there is a kind of like a switch like immediately this is not the same person i gotta say it did take me a second to see that there was two people i know a lot of people in the comments said that so that creeped me out in the beginning but i don't know this sort of reminds me of like one of the TikToks we covered in a prior episode where like this woman sort of like has this same change where like you can kind of see like something happen, right? Or like an entity went inside her, like it's not the same person. And this kind of just gives me off like that same vibe. Same here. I just feel like this one, it looks a little bit more unhuman and just the way the person starts acting in the in the video, it changes from like just a friend like laughing, having fun to some kind of entity like taking over his body and just staring around being like like where am i as if they didn't know what they were doing or they don't know like they're trying to grasp the situation that they're in right now right like his eyes they seem to like roll back in his head and it almost seems like he's kind of like foaming at the mouth or something like like his teeth are sticking out his exactly hands curling up as if it's a claw like it's definitely a big transformation compared to the prior, um, you could say, possession we saw. Oh, yeah. And like, I feel like this one compared to that video is a lot more prominent. Like, you will literally see that switch. It's He seems like sort of primal for some reason. 
So I wonder what this is. Definitely let us know what you guys think about it when we post it on our Instagram. All right. And with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And again, like I mentioned in the beginning, we are now on YouTube at Calaveria. Be sure to subscribe to us if you guys like to have something on in the background while you cook, clean, whatever the case may be. You know, we're there for you guys. And as always, if you have a story to tell or just want to share anything with us, be sure to email us at calaveriapod at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us also on our TikTok and Instagram at calaveriapod. And please feel free to leave a rating or review on whatever podcasting app that you are listening to us on. And I recently noticed that uh, Spotify actually has like this new feature where it's sort of like a Q&A sort of thing, right? You can sort of leave a comment on um, any episode. So I know Spotify doesn't necessarily let you leave a review, but if you have a question or you want to comment on the episode, feel free to do so. We always welcome feedback and we'd love to hear from you guys. So if there's nothing else, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace. Bye.